Jeffrey Thomas with us. Uh, he is, he's been the pastor of Alfred Place Baptist Church at a town called Aberystwyth in Wales for 50 years. And it's a church that sent the Underhills here. From 1975. And then before I invite him to come and preach to us, I'd like to read the first letter, the first letter of first Peter, first Peter chapter 1, uh, and verse 1 to 12. The first letter of Peter, 1, 1 to 12. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Excuse me. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power being girded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if need necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you do, not see, you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be, to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which ages long to look. Welcome, my brother. And preach to us. Well, it's always a privilege for me to, to be here. I've been coming to uh, Kenya now, to this congregation for um, 40 years. And I was here when the sod was cut and the uh, foundations were laid on this building. And was uh, with you before in, in Keith's home when we used to meet there. And I look forward to coming every time I return refreshed and, uh, and renewed. It's been a strange time in my life. Um, for the last two months now, I've uh, ceased being the uh, pastor preacher in, um, in Aberystwyth. And uh, it's an, a new pattern for me. And uh, you know I'm caring for my wife who has Alzheimer's uh, at this time of the year. And uh, I've left her in the tender hands of our three daughters. She's going from one daughter to another. She loves to be, to be with them. And so these are uh, trying times uh, for me. Um, I'm speaking to the women the, this afternoon at 3 o'clock on worry. Uh, the biblical analysis and help in dealing with our worries and I enjoyed my time uh, a year ago and uh, I hope uh, it'll be possible for me to come out uh, 
every year still, even with my domestic circumstances. I want to draw your attention to this passage of scripture that uh, was read in your hearing in 1 Peter chapter 1. And uh, this is 8 and 9. Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. In whom, though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your souls. And I want to talk to you this morning about the uh, enormous privileges that a Christian enjoys. Sometimes we give the impression in, of the Christian life that it's uh, really a very difficult and negative kind of life, things we don't agree with, practices we don't approve of, uh, places you can't go to. And uh, people think, poor Christians then. And some of you uh, younger people are looking enviously at your companions and friends, the peer group in your schools, and you envy the freedom, supposedly, that they enjoy. Well, we don't think of that like that any longer. Uh, We've given up what we couldn't keep, and uh, we've gained what we, we could never lose. And in the words that I've read to you, Peter is uh, reminding us of some of the enormous privileges that a Christian enjoys. And the first uh, privilege that a Christian enjoys is that he has someone he believes in. Though now you see him not, you believe in him. Verse 8, you don't see him, but you believe in him. Well, how is that possible? We have a saying... Seeing's believing. And uh, people say, oh, well, uh, I'd, uh, it would be nice for me to believe, but uh, I, I, I couldn't do it. But uh, some of you, you never, you never knew your grandparents. Your grandmother died before you were born. But you've heard your mother speak of her many times when you say to her, tell me about when you were young. Tell me, mum. Mama, tell me about uh, your mama. And uh, she tells you. And when she speaks of her mother, her her voice softens and her her eyes fill. And uh, there's a peace and a a lovely thoughtfulness and delight in remembering that woman who looked after her and cared for her and loved her when she was a little girl. The tone of affection with which she speaks of her mother brings conviction and longing into your heart. Do you believe that she existed? That grandmother, you never saw her. Do you believe that she lived? Well, of course you do. You believe your grandmother lived, though you never saw her, because of the testimony of someone who did see her, who was with her, and knew her. And that is how it was with these Christians in what we call now Turkey, but then Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, Galatia. They hadn't seen Jesus. The only time he ever left uh, Israel was when he went to Africa as a little baby with his father and mother. He never came to Europe, but uh, his mother and father took him away from Herod and he went to Egypt, didn't he? For a few years until Herod had died. Jesus never went to Turkey. But people who had seen Jesus, uh, they'd been there. Peter had traveled. Peter was a a church planter and an apologist and an evangelist and a teacher about Jesus Christ. He says, I was an eyewitness of his majesty. And this is how uh, we folks in Kenya have come to believe in Jesus Christ in the 21st century. 
Um, I was in school with a man who became the leader of the Labour Party, uh, Neil Kinnock. He was a couple of years younger than me. <clears throat> I was saved in 1954, and in 1955 we started a, a Christian union in the school, Bible studies, and he came along. He's three years younger than me. And uh, he was interested in that time in the gospel. But he went into politics. He followed me to university, the same university we went to. And then um, <clears throat> he walked into uh, a seat with a vast Labour majority and uh, he became the leader of the Labour Party. He stood against Mrs. Thatcher. And he was interviewed then about uh, what his religious beliefs were. And he said uh, to the reporter, um, well, I greatly admire religious people. His mother was a religious, religious person. I greatly admire them. But I couldn't take a leap into the dark. That's what he said. So I wrote to him. And I said to him, Neil, remember the times when you were with me in the Christian Union and when we had Bible studies together. Do you remember? Now you know that uh, becoming a Christian isn't a leap into the dark. It is being told about Jesus Christ, about his extraordinary life, about his teaching, about his power over creation and over the devil and over disease and over death. It's about his great uh, sermons, his parables. It's about his atonement and his resurrection. It is coming to the light. It is, it is not a leap into the dark. It is responding to him. I was with my dear cousins. I always visit them when I'm preaching in South Wales. And I visited them. And my cousin's husband is a joiner. He's got a big carpentry business. And I always overstay. And I put a meeting in the night. And I put a hurry. And I'm putting my coat on. And I'm talking to them in the kitchen. And suddenly, as I'm about to go, he says, what does a person mean when he says, I've seen the light? Well, I want a question. The question you long people in the office tomorrow or in the university tomorrow will, will ask you about. And I'm, I've got two minutes. So I said to him, well, that person has seen the light of the world is Jesus Christ. He's seen the shadowlands of this world and all the, the poor figures that fill it. And he's seen in Jesus Christ and somebody wonderful thinks, well, there's a man in work with me and, oh, he used to be drinking a lot and he'd hit his wife and he's changed. He's transformed. And I said to him, um, I said to him, well, what, what's happened to you, Di? What's happened to you? I've seen the light, he says to me. I've seen the light. Well, if they ask you what's happened to you, don't, don't give a cliché like that. Because it, it leaves them perplexed. What, what do we mean? Explain to them about uh, the Bible, the Jesus Christ of the Bible and the church you go to. And then you can say, oh, come with me. Come with me next Sunday. It's a response to light. So here is... Uh, the, uh, the response that we have to Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and Paul and Peter and James and Jude and the writer to the Hebrews and so on. We listen to what they say, what they wrote. and We find a kindling, uh, the beginnings of warmth and understanding beginning to burn in us. We believe in the one who preached the Sermon on the Mount. Peter says, we believe in him. He doesn't say we believe him, we believe in him. It's uh, not just having some opinions now and convictions about him, like you do about various political parties, about economic issues. It's a special Greek construction. You know, every bit of Greek now that there is in 
There's ever been discoveries on a database. You're IT conscious and familiar here. You know more about it than I do. I'm sure all you young people do. All the classical Greek writings, the philosophies, the plays, and so on, that's all on the base. And there's a little bit of papyrus that's found uh, preserved in the Egyptian sands for 2,000 years. That's on there. To every new piece they add it, everything in, in ancient Greek, in what we call Koine, common Greek, the Greek of the New Testament, that's there as well. And so then, for scholars, it's wonderful. You sit down and you type in a phrase. And you want to know where this phrase is found and how it's used in the Greek language. Believe into. And you feed it in and then the machine hums a little bit. And then it starts to print out. And you pick up the paper and you look at it. And you will discover that the only place in all of the Greek culture and language where this phrase to believe into is found is the New Testament. Only there. In other words, it was invented by the apostles, uh, the Holy Spirit through the apostles, to explain to us the nature of saving faith. The nature of the relationship of a sinner who believes to the Savior who receives him. That we are joined to him. Jonathan Edwards would say that uh, saving faith is a connecting grace. It plugs us in to Jesus Christ in the glory of his person and in the power of his saving work as our prophet and priest and our king, the God-man. And we're joined to him when we believe into him. Let me talk about a, a proposal of marriage to make that plain to you. You know you meet somebody here. And uh, you uh, sit down and you eat together and you talk together and then you see more of one another uh, when you're here in church. And then uh, you, you go out together and you go on a date together and then you see more and more of one another and in those early years you talk. How you talk and talk and talk. You see it in a restaurant, there's an old couple there, they just eat. But a young couple, oh, they talk and talk. And you watch him, you watch him, what is he like? How, how, what are his views, what are his standards? How is he with his parents? How is he with your parents? How is he with members of the opposite sex? How does he behave? What does he want to do with his life? And you watch him and you build up a, a picture of him and you imagine what life will be like with him. And then one day when the moon is out and he gets down on a knee and he brings a little blue box out and he opens it and he takes a ring out and he says, will you marry me? Your response then is an informed response, an educated response, a knowledgeable response. It's a response of your mind and your understanding to him as he has manifested himself to you in all the times you have talked and talked and talked together. No, it's like that. This is your first time here. As Marungi says, we're so pleased you come and we hope you'll come. That you'll be a familiar face here. That you feel when you've come here, you've come home. But this is a place that honors the Jesus Christ of the Bible. We, we worship him. And you will learn about him. And we want you to entrust yourself. We want you to believe in Jesus Christ. We want you to be joined to him, to become one with him forever and ever and ever. Not saving faith. You, you trust in Jesus Christ. That word faith, it's a Latin-based word. It's a, it's a 
difficult word. It's a cold word, I think, faith. Trust. Now it's an Anglo-Saxon word. You know what trust is, don't you? You've got a digital clock at the side of your bed and you trust it. You wake up in the night, you can't sleep. You look at it, it says 2.22. And, you know, except when there's a power shortage and it goes on the blink. You can trust what it says. You don't have to adjust it. It doesn't get slow. It doesn't get fast. You trust it's 2.22. You can trust everything about Jesus Christ. You can't trust everything about me. Because I'm a sinner. And I need the grace of Jesus Christ to help me day by day. Don't trust me. But you can trust my Savior. You can trust everything about him. When he said on the cross, it is finished, then it's, it's finished. All, all he did, all he achieved there, was complete enough for, for our salvation. You can trust him when your life is falling apart. If you were joined to him, when he said he has all authority in heaven and earth, you go back to the first cause. Um, I don't know why he has permitted my wife to have Alzheimer's. And now she doesn't know my name. We've been married 52 years. But uh, God is his own interpreter. God will make it plain. I'm not going to a heaven where there will be eternal perplexity. I can trust him. That there, he said in his word, he works all things together for, for the good of those that love him. And this is part of those all things. And I trust him. <laughs> I trust my Savior, Jesus Christ. That's a Christian. That is salvation. I, I want you to understand this now. Because this is really enormously important what a Christian is. I have a friend, Reg Burroughs, and he's a preacher. And he was preaching one Sunday, and he went to the door and shook hands with people. And a woman came on to him, and she thanked him for the message. And she said to him, well, I hope I manage to do enough for God to accept me. Okay, that's what she said. I hope I manage to do enough for God to accept me. Now, when someone says something like that, it's very helpful. Because you know they haven't understood the gospel. They don't know what the message of Christianity is. And so Reg did what I would do and what you, you Christians would do. You, you'd go along and you would have a, a cup of chai with her and you would chat to her and, uh, and you would explain that we don't have to do enough for God to accept us. That Jesus Christ, our federal head, our Lord, our Savior, he has done everything that is needed for God to accept us. That's what he's done. By his righteous life, his being born under the law, his submission to the law of God, by his giving pleasure to God in everything that he did. The 30 years of obscurity in Nazareth, God said, I'm very... I'm very pleased that you grew in favor with man as well as with me. You understand, we are saved by what Jesus Christ achieved, not by what we achieved. You know the sound of music, everybody knows the sound of everybody's favorite musical. And uh, you know Maria in the end, she gets the captain, doesn't she? She gets it. And she sings. She just can't believe it. She's hit the jackpot. She's got this uh, big, handsome dude. And she sings, and you know what she sings? She's, when she says, somewhere in my youth or childhood, I must have done something good. That's what she says. She's trying to work out how she's got this guy. She says, ah, I'm being rewarded because I helped a little old lady over the road. Because I was kind to my dog. Because I looked after my mother when she was old. 
somewhere in my youth or childhood, I did have something good. And so God has, has blessed me with this feather. I got a, three daughters and my youngest daughter, three of them. I don't know about Free. I think she was born with a silver spoon in her mouth. Things seem to work out so wonderfully for her. Every, I thought, oh, Free, this. Oh, dear, how has this happened for you again? She flutters her long eyelashes and she says, Somewhere in my youth or childhood, <laughs> I must have done something good. She says. She knows it's a heresy. And she wants to pull the leg of her old man. That's what she does. But do you understand? Blessings that come into our lives don't come because we've done something. I'm sure you've done many wonderful things. But you've done no perfect things. You haven't loved God with all your heart. You haven't loved your neighbor as yourself. You've just failed. The best things that you've done need to be forgiven as well as the worst things that you've done. And if we are saved, then we are saved through, through the good things that Jesus did. That's why he came. And by the atonement he made in obtaining forgiveness for us. Well, now, you say, he's still on his first point and it's three o'clock in the afternoon. Have you got someone you believe in? Do you have someone you, you really entrust yourself to? Do you have some? I've got three sons-in-law, smart guys. I had a friend, uh, he gave his daughter away in marriage. and He said, I mean, she married a Welshman. It was like putting a Stradivarius violin in the hands of a gorilla. I thought he was very favoured in marrying a Welshman myself. Well now then, uh, my three sons-in-law, we were sitting around the table and uh, one of them said, if there was a leader in the world today that you would like to meet, who would it be? Wow, that is a conversation stopper. Who would you like to meet in the world today? What European politician? What American politician? What American candidate <laughs> would you like to meet in the world today? We all scratched our heads. And then uh, my wife said... Uh, She'd like to meet the late president of South Africa. Nelson Mandela she'd like to meet. Well, that was good. That was a nice answer. I agree with that. We're not living in a world, in a continent, where there are leaders now of great intelligence, morality, integrity, wisdom. We long that there should be such. Who have you got? If you're going to turn away from my saviour. And, and you're going to be. Uh, you're going to be saying politics is the answer. Socialism is the answer. Nationalism is the answer. Who have you got? He is, oh, he is such a saviour for you. Worthy of you uh, trusting yourself to him. Like many of us here, for many, many decades, we've entrusted ourselves to him. I'll hurry through my next points. The second great privilege for the Christian is that he has someone to love, whom having not seen, you love. Verse 8. And I'll use the same illustration about your grandmother. You love lying in bed and your mother's putting you to bed and telling you a story and you say to her, tell me about grandmama. Tell me about when the leopard came to chase the chickens. She, 
I've told you that story. Ah, oh, tell me it again. Tell me that when the bucket fell down the well and, uh, and mum was so, grandma was so upset and you got string on a bucket and you made a coat hanger with a hook on it and you got it out and she was so pleased. You tell me the story. You've heard it so often. Tell me. Because you have grown to love this person you never saw on the testimony of your mother's portrait of her to you. When you read a great book, when you read Dalimore's Life of Whitfield or the lives of Spur the two volumes Life of Spurgeon, when you read the life of John Murray, at the end of it, oh, you love him. Oh, you get that book and you hold it to you because you've grown in such affection. When you read the life of Hudson Taylor, what a giant, what a wonderful man he is. Now these Christians, they loved Jesus Christ, but they'd never seen him. They loved him because uh, Peter could sit and reminisce of the three years he'd spent with him. The books in the world couldn't fill be filled with all the things that Jesus said and did. and They just built up such a picture of our glorious and wonderful and memorable Savior. And they grew in love for him. And they gave their lives to him. But it wasn't, of course, physical association with Jesus. It wasn't a sight of Jesus that made people love him. Because Judas saw him and Judas didn't love him. And the Pharisees saw him and heard him. And Caiaphas and Annas saw him and heard him. They hated him. It's more if Jesus came in today and, and stood here. You think you might become a believer? You'd say, very interesting. But it takes... Uh, a work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives. It takes a revelation from God so that Peter can say you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He didn't do that by flesh and blood. And he needed an encounter with God. He needed the Holy Spirit to take the word. When I ask you to come to Jesus Christ this morning and believe on him, I'm talking by that phrase, coming to Christ, by, of, a, of a response of your heart as the Holy Spirit takes the words I'm giving to you and, and changes your heart and, and draws your heart and brings you to Jesus Christ. And those who come to him, they, they love him. The natural man doesn't love Jesus. He's interested in him. He talks well about him. Isaiah preached about him and uh, people didn't understand what he was talking about. They thought he was like a, just like a stick in the wilderness being blown by the wind. A root. There was nothing there that they desired him. Who's believed my preaching, our report, he says. And that's got to happen first. A Christian is someone who believes in Christ, but that, that, that belief, it, it warms. It becomes living. It becomes a, an affection, a passion. My mother's uncle was converted in the 1904 revival in Wales and he held children's meetings. My mother and her sister went along to it and sometime during the First World War, around 1916, my mother gave her heart in a very simple way to the Lord Jesus. She was let down by lots of preachers afterwards. They didn't build her up. But she loved the Lord and so my upbringing was surrounded by him singing. Um, what, when she cooked and when she washed and when she cleaned and she would sing how sweet the name of Jesus sounds she would sing the Lord's my shepherd I'll not want 
One day my friend Brian said to me, we were about 16 years of age, your mother's remarkable, isn't she? I said, yes. He said, the way she sings hymns all the time. His mother didn't sing hymns. I thought every mother sang hymns. <laughs> it was an expression of this faith she had. It was turned to praise, to doxology, to love. You know, when preachers talk and challenge a congregation, do you love the Lord? When my uncle would say to my mother when she was a little girl, do you love him best? Best you love him? She would be shy and she'd hang her head and she'd say, yes, she did. But all of us, we feel guilty. We, we don't feel we love the Lord as we should. We don't. But we do love him. And we love his life. We love his teaching. We love his purity, his integrity. His relationship with women and the way they give him children to hold. We love the way that when they spread his arms out on the cross and nailed him to that cross, he prayed for them. He didn't curse them and say, you wait till my father gets hold of you. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We, we, we love all that about him. But we love him most of all because... He first loved us <laughs> when we were nothing and nobodies. When he'd seen the file on us, he loved us then. And he gave his life for us. And when they wanted him to end the enfleshment and come down from the cross, uh, he wouldn't come down because he loved us and wanted us to be where he is for forever and ever. Our dear Savior, we love him. Well, now, I ask what Uncle Oliver asked Mom, do, do, you, do you love him? Do you have more than an academic and intellectual response? Is it more than a cerebral response to Jesus Christ? That you love him and then you say, Lord, it is my chief complaint that my love is weak and faint. Yet I love thee and adore, oh, for grace to love thee more. That's what a Christian says. A Christian has someone he believes in, and a Christian is someone he loves. Well, who do you love then? I know you love your family, and you love them. Are there sportsmen that you love? Are there personalities on the media? Are there people in, in Hollywood that you love? With a pure heart and fervently? A Christian has got someone he loves. Thirdly, uh, uh, a Christian, he has uh, someone then, and uh, he makes him happy. Okay, that's a cliche. Let me give you the words that Peter uses. Filled with joy unspeakable and full of glory. the fact of being a Christian that's what it does to us and for us it gives us an inexpressible joy now um, it also of course there are times when our hearts break there are times when David's heart broke oh Absalom my son my son I wish I died in your place they wept at the tomb of uh, Lazarus. And there's been weeping in this congregation in the last days, hasn't there? And there, that must be. The Christian is not unfamiliar with tears. May we never, never be unfamiliar with grief. The outward man is, is perishing. The thorn in the flesh is so hard. But Peter says, but we have a joy. We have a joy that's um, 
indescribable. So I've got to use words to describe an emotion, and that's always difficult. I can't say it's like an electric shock. That, that's not what this joy is like. But it's... Um, Alexander Nesbitt, who writes a, a lovely commentary on uh, First Peter, a Scottish Puritan, he says, the child of God can have now and then. He is filled with such joy that he can't keep it within doors. All right? When you get a job at last, you tell everybody, you tell your friends, you tell your family, you tell your wife, I've got a job. The interview went well. When a healthy baby is born, when twins are born, you tell everybody about it. You'd be a, a strange figure, wouldn't you, if you kept it all to yourself, a loner. We've been baptized by the Spirit into a body and we share our, our joys. The Christian knows great joy as we walk down the road. One foot says amen and the other says hallelujah as we walk down. It's a joy that is uh, unspeakable, that is indescribable. We need to sing. We're going to sing in a minute uh, about the Lord Jesus. My favorite hymn. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in the believer's ear. And we sing it because it's so true to us. We, we sing, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise. It's a, it, we need a, a great company of people to be moved and thrilled by it. It's joy that's unspeakable. And it's full of glory, that is. It's not manufactured. It's not an Ertzatz kind of of manufactured joy. It's not that I'm using the microphone and dimming the lights and we're singing over and over again and I'm trying to build up an atmosphere. That's carnal. It's a holy joy. It's a, the joy of the glory of heaven. And it's come down and the joy of the Lord is our strength. God is a God of joy. There's no neuroses in God. There are no depressions and anxieties in God. He's not twisting his hands in horror as the world goes out of control. God, the blessed God, and he gives us his joy. My joy shall be in you. And that sustains us and that keeps us through our lives. The joy of God. Well, now, what, what, there are all these TV programs and they're designed to make you laugh. And make you happy. And there's all this drinking. And all this nicotine. And these drugs. And all this. Because people who are without Christ. Are without joy. And I'm saying to you. The reason for your dark spirit. Is because you don't know our savior. And you need to have him. You need to have him in you. Christ in you, the joy of God. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You need him in your life. I will never leave you nor forsake you. You need him. Well, what gives you joy? I'm asking you. What, what you believe in? Who you believe in? Who you love? What gives you joy? You, you know, mock our faith. You say our faith is like a crutch and we can only get by because we've got... What's your crutch? What are you depending on? Jesus Christ, then. Jesus Christ, he gives us joy. And last of all, uh, Jesus Christ gives us a purpose in life. Then he says here that... Uh, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. You receive, you get, you achieve the end of your faith. You achieve your goal in life. You, you, get, you, you get to understand what life is all about. What is man's chief end? It is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. You know, you know why you're here. You're not here for a religious high. 
you're here that whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, you do it to the glory of God and you, you're given strength to do that day by day. You, you, you achieve the end. This is a generation without any purpose, isn't it? What are they living for? Some people have set goals for themselves and then they've achieved that goal. So many shillings a year in a salary and they get that and they're not any more joyful as a result of it. Some people never attain goals they've set for themselves. Well, the, the, the wonderful blessing of the Christian is we are going to achieve our goal. We are going to receive the end of, of our faith. We, we know why we are here. Paul could say at the end, I fought a good fight. Fought a good fight. Finished the course. Kept the faith. And now there's a crown of life that's laid up for me, and not for me only, but for all who loved his appearing. There's, there's a purpose that's been fulfilled. I know what my life was all about. Do you know what your life is all about? Do you know who you are? Do you know what you're here for? You're made in God's image and likeness and you can't know yourself until you know God. And you know God through his son, Jesus Christ, and that's eternal life. It's coming just as you are and putting your trust in him and then he explains to you then what you're to do. The day you get up and you say, Lord, I give my hands to you and my affections to you, and my mind to you, and my limbs to you, and help me today to live for your glory. You achieve the end of trusting in God every day. It's like that. God guides and God leads us. And so we're here. We're not in the flames of hell under God's righteous judgment today. It's a day of grace. He's brought me from Wales. He's brought you from all across Nairobi here to hear of the great privileges of being a Christian. God's done that. That this hasn't happened by chance. Or weren't you lucky to be here today? It was God's plan for you to be here. And for you to hear of this Savior. In order for you to have him as you as Savior. That's why God has brought you here. He wants you to take his son. As your teacher and your lamb of God. And your good shepherd to keep you and be with you forever. And that's why he's brought you here. And your response then is simply, uh, here I am. I'm sorry I've been so reluctant. And that for so long I've, uh, I've put you off. And I've put off closing with Jesus Christ. It's time for you to believe. Isn't this a wonderful providence, you know? No one can ever take God's providence from you. God's providence is our inheritance as Christians. That's part of receiving the end of our faith. That's what we do as believers. I've spoken to you this morning about four great privileges. A Christian is someone he believes in, someone he loves, someone who gives him joy unspeakable, and he gives him his purpose and helps him to fulfill that purpose in life. I can't understand how any one of you would leave this gathering today without this Savior. That you go back into the twilight zone when you've been brought into the light of Jesus Christ. The only explanation that I have for it is that men love darkness rather than light. Oh, don't be a darkness lover. Come to the light. Come, you come now. You come, you come today. You give in to the witness of the Holy Spirit to your heart. If Jesus was standing here in the front, I'd say, come to the front. But the word is now you. It's there. It's, it's in your heart. It's in your mouth. It's in your mind now. The word of faith that we've preached to you. That is beseeching you. To take Jesus Christ from now on. Have him as your Lord and Savior from now on. Take him. Don't go a day, don't go an hour without him. Holy God, bless your word to us now, we pray. Give it saving power. Oh, work 
in pity in the hearts and lives of people whose lives are in such a muddle and are here today who have uh, laboring with guilt and shame. Oh Lord, what can wash away their sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ, thy son. Oh, please cleanse them and wash them and renew them and make them new people. Give them one they can believe in and love. One that can give them joy. One that can fulfill their deepest longings. Lord, hear these our prayers which we bring in Christ's great and glorious name. Amen.